You know, I thought since we've been talking about mouthpieces and, you know, equipment uh, and standards for testing and all that stuff, that I would share with you at least a few ideas of what I call at least my philosophy of equipment. Whether you know it or not, you have a philosophy of equipment too. You've either developed it consciously and it's very ordered and very structured and very rational, or else it's sort of a hodgepodge of kind of different ideas and intuitions. Uh, some good, some bad, some maybe just downright weird. Uh, who knows? But let me encourage you to develop a very rational and very reasonable philosophy of equipment. Now, as a young player, uh, I was influenced by two extreme positions uh, that I, I had to characterize both as rather insane. The first position is one I see very often nowadays, is that people think, I'm just going to, I'm going to look around and find that special piece of equipment, that special clarinet, that special mouthpiece that's going to give me the stardust that I need to become a great, great player. And uh, it may be uh, one of those old mouthpieces that was a legendary mouthpieces from a certain time that had a certain kind of rubber and this and that. Um, or it may be uh, something that uh, some very famous person endorses and he plays it and he sounds great and so on and so forth. The other extreme position was actually characterized by one of my teachers uh, who used to laugh about how people would get say, a new instrument or a new mouthpiece or whatever, uh, and within no time they were sounding just as bad as they ever did, or oh, they sounded, no. you know, there was nothing any better about their playing. That kind of attitude sort of led me to despair, uh, because I thought, gee, no matter what I do with equipment, I'm just never going to get any better. Well, there is uh, a reasonable position between those two extremes, and I'd like to share it with you right now. Between those two fantasy land uh, attitudes uh, is the reasonable position that I'm going to present to you now. And that is um, what we should be able to expect of equipment is that equipment should improve our playing in as far as it enables us to achieve the things that we want to achieve uh, in you know, the very, say, characteristic of clarinet sound and uh, the style of playing that we want to do. And it should also make it easier uh, to accomplish the things that we want to accomplish and to play correctly. What equipment will not do, equipment will not substitute for your faults. It will not make up for bad embouchure. It will not make up for uh, inequ inadequate uh, air support. And it will cause you to actually develop habits, a very inefficient playing habits, uh, making you move excessively and adjust excessively whereas good equipment will enable you to minimize any kind of adjustments. I define it like this in my book, The Educator's Guide to the Clarinet. Acoustical efficiency enables you to play the instrument low, the clarinet low, high, and loud and soft with a minimum of embouchure air pressure exchange. What do I mean by that? I mean that when you play the clarinet uh, low, high, loud, or soft, you have a certain ideal proportion of embouchure and air uh, to achieve that particular sound, that particular volume, and to play in that particular range. Well, the more uniform, the more even, the more efficient equipment is, uh, the less you're going to have to make changes from register to register, dynamic to dynamic, changes in embouchure and air pressure in order to maintain that ideal sound that you have in your ear. And those and to achieve those nice connections, nice, smooth, beautiful phrases. So that's acoustical efficiency. It enables you to play low, high, and loud, and soft with a minimum of embouchure air pressure uh, exchange. Or you could actually even compress the aphorism a little more by saying that acoustical efficiency enables you to play the full pitch and dynamic range of the clarinet with a minimum of embouchure air pressure exchange. And this is what the professionals that I know are always seeking in equipment. They're not seeking equipment that's going to give them the stardust. It's not going to seeking equipment that's going to make up for their faults. They, they work diligently on, on improving their clarinet playing, their clarinet techniques, their tone production techniques, and so on. They're looking for equipment that is going to enable them to play correctly and to achieve what they want to achieve artistically with a lot more physical ease and a lot more efficiency. 
and that's the reasonable position on equipment. Even though the ideas we've shared up to now are true, they're, st they're not complete because we don't have any practical application of them. Just to say that, some, that you need to play with equipment that plays efficiently is kind of abstract. It doesn't give you really solid ideas. For that, you need to uh, consult some other sources. Uh, if you're not familiar with my Educator's Guide to the Clarinet, many people consider it the best book written on playing and teaching the clarinet. Uh, the first six chapters of the book uh, are on um, playing mechanics and efficient playing mechanics and how to develop them. And then the last six chapters of the book are all about equipment and what good equipment is and how to test for it. And I would recommend that. And if you find some other source, that would be fine too. But the main thing is to begin to develop a coherent theory and good, concrete, reasonable ideas about what you can reasonably expect of equipment what's unreasonable, and uh, the methods that you need for testing equipment and getting good, solid information. Let me tell you, when you go out to perform, the listener is not the least bit interested in what famous person endorsed your mouthpiece, or whether your mouthpiece comes from that mystical uh, rubber formula from Alt-6, um, or uh, what is stamped on the label of your, of your instrument, what label is stamped on there. They're only interested in one thing. They're interested in a, uh, an enjoyable uh, musical experience. And, and they respond when you have freedom, when you have ease, when you have the flexibility that you need in order to achieve that uh, with your instrument, with your equipment. That's all they care about, and it's all you should care about, too. Uh, if you develop these... Uh, uh, these methods of testing, uh, if you get good solid learning about this stuff, uh, you're going to find that equipment that's going to give you that ease and freedom that so you can unselfconsciously play with a lot of spontaneous expression. Um, that'll be very satisfactory to you and certainly satisfactory to those that listen. Anyway, thank you very much for speaking about listening. Thank you very much for listening to our videos. Please subscribe if you haven't already so you're notified. Visit our website. Uh, take a look at my Educator's Guide to the Clarinet. I think uh, that you'll definitely benefit from all the knowledge that's in it. Um, and uh, let's see, what else? Gee, I think that's all for now. I'll see you next time. <laughs>